All right, we're back. Not too long ago, I made a video talking about what I call basic essay structure. And in that video, I talked about introductions, body paragraphs, conclusions, and I said that an intro has a thesis statement, a claim, and that the body paragraphs basically provide examples, evidence of that claim, and the conclusion wraps things up in a nice little package to, to make it feel like, yes, we, we learned something, here's, here's what we learned, and here's what we can do with that information. So that's this is a very basic structure. Uh, now I wanna build off of that idea, because we're going to talk about a different type of structure that's a little more specific, and it it is, I have adapted it from Aristotle, I'm tweaking it a little bit, and we're calling it the classical essay, or you can call it a classic argument. And, uh, and again, I'm tweaking it a little bit, so I'm gonna I'll probably refer to it as the classic style, because I'm not going to talk about the original Greek terms or the Latin terms of the components of it, but I am gonna walk you through the basic structure of a classic argument. So, let's go. So Aristotle was pretty amazing at, at looking at the world and breaking it down into components and he did that with lots of things. He was, you know, a scientist, zoologist, you know, and uh, loved to think about physics and biology and things like that. And he also loved to study what we call rhetoric, the art of communication. And so when we talk about the classic argument uh, in, in this course and maybe other courses that you'll take, uh, the classic argument stems from Aristotle's idea as to what would be uh, effective in an argument. So. The first thing that I want to tell you is that in my class, and this is not necessarily from Aristotle, this part's where it's my little version of it, but in my class, when I talk about the classic style of argument, that comes with the idea that there's a specific goal, that there's a specific goal to a classic argument, and that goal is to win, to win your reader over meaning that you want your reader to read this essay, learn something, and then ultimately agree with you. You want your reader to agree with the points in your essay. So with that in mind, uh, I want you to think about potential audiences of uh, a classic styled argument. If your audience is someone that already agrees with you, well then that's easy. Then you're, you're giving them the words and the idea that will sort of clarify and strengthen what they already believe in. Think of politicians when they are making a speech to thousands of people that are already planning to vote for the politician. Uh, that would be exa an example of what we sometimes call preaching to the choir, right? Meaning that, that everybody already agrees with this, but you are giving them specific words and specific reasons and maybe continuing to educate them, but they, they already agree with you. So that's not the kind of audience I want you to think about. There's two other audiences. There's, of course, the audience that is your opposing viewpoint, the person that disagrees with you. Now, when we take the classic approach, they ultimately might not be won over, right? Someone that is on the opposing side of your argument might be so stubborn that they would read your essay, and no matter how brilliant you are, they don't they don't vote for who you want them to vote, or they don't behave the way you want them. They don't stop eating meat if you write a pro-vegetarian essay, or if you're saying, hey, those, those new Star Wars movies, they're good, and they're like, no, I hate The Force Awakens. I am not going to, you know, what, whatever it is, a movie review or a political treatise, they can read it, you can deliver as many wonderful points as you can, but uh, they're still not won over. Maybe that's because the essay's weak, but let's assume that you wrote a good essay and and you gave point after point uh, of, about why you and your views are correct, and they are still just doing it out of stubbornness. I consider that, if not a win, at least it's a stalemate, um, because sometimes you just can't win people over. If you've ever gotten to an argument with a person, or maybe a friendly debate, and you had your side, they had their side, and you decided, like, I really want to fight to win them over, and so you, you've got evidence, you've got the pathos and logos and, and ethos, and so you give them evidence number one, two, three, four, five, and they give you ideas, and you refute all those ideas. You show them, show them all of your research, and there's, there's all of the evidence that you could possibly present. And they still, like, fold their arms, like, nope, the earth is flat. And you're like, why? I disproved everything you said about your flat earth theory. And they're like, that's just how I feel. 
if, if that's all they have left, if it's just boils down to like, that's just what I think, or that's just how I feel, and I don't care about evidence, yeah, you might not win them over, but they've kind of shown you that, that, uh, that they're, they, they've kind of shown you that all they have is their stubbornness. So the, think of, of that as a potential audience uh, member, the opposition. Hopefully you win them over, or maybe at least get them thinking. Uh, there's a good chance <laughs> that, that the opposition is just gonna hold on to their belief system, but if you argue well enough and all they have is just their stubbornness, that's, that's pretty good, that's, that's good stuff there. If you were in an actual you know, debate being judged, uh, the, the judges would, they would, they would give it to you. So that's one way of thinking of it. The best audience, I think, to consider for writing a classic style argument in which the goal is to win the reader over is to think of a fence sitter. Look, I've got a fence back there. That's a nice coincidence. So a fence sitter, when we say a fence sitter, that means somebody is up there sitting on the fence, meaning that they're in between two ideas and they can't decide what to do. They don't know which side they should be in. They don't know which politician to vote for, or they don't know whether to be a, you know, a vegetarian, or if they should eat meat. You know, they, they, they can't decide. That's a great audience to think about. It's a great audience to think about when you're writing an argument essay, because that will help shape the way you communicate with your reader. So if you imagine that your reader is a fence sitter, there are then can be different reasons as to why they're sitting on that fence. I like to put them into three different categories. So I think of fence sitters as, A, they are unaware. So a fence sitter might not have an opinion one way or another about an argument issue because they didn't even know that there was a problem. They didn't know that there was an issue. Once upon a time, when my daughters were very young, they decided they wanted to play soccer. And so uh, that was great, you know, let's go to the sporting goods store. We went to the sporting goods store to get their uniform and to get a soccer ball. And I picked up a soccer ball and on that soccer ball, it said, this product was not made by children. So why would a soccer ball say this product is not made by children? because that meant that many soccer balls have been made by children. Now, at the time, this blew me away because I had heard about child labor and the, the agricultural industry and things like that, but I had never imagined like little tiny, you know, eight-year-old hands stitching together soccer balls. That disturbed me and frightened me. So that was an issue that I had not been made aware of. And I went online and learned, learned about it and, and was, you know, won over. So making somebody aware of the problem uh, is, th th that's great. Think of this though, right? If some fence sitters are unaware, some fence sitters might be apathetic. The apathetic fence sitter is the person who knows that, yeah, I know there's an issue, I know there's a back and forth debate, but I'm sitting on the fence, you know why? Because I don't really care one way or another. There's soccer balls made by kids, who cares? It's a good price, they're selling them at Walmart. It's good, it's a good deal. So. In that case, you want to deliver enough pathos in your argument to make the reader care. Tell us true stories, give us shocking evidence with logos, uh, you know, so use uh, direct quotes from experts uh, that are filled with, you know, emotional content. Do whatever you can to make the apathetic fence sitter empathetic. And a third category of fence sitter that you can think about is the ambivalent fence sitter. Uh, ambivalence, that's different than being apathetic. Uh, ambivalent means that you have conflicting emotions. So the ambivalent reader is sophisticated enough that they are concerned about it. Uh, they do know about it. So let's go back to that soccer ball uh, example. Uh, there could be somebody that says like, yeah, I, I, I know that there's child labor that you know, is making sporting goods and soccer balls made by you know, little eight, nine-year-old kids, and uh, I feel bad about that. But at the same time, I'm not sure you know, if we're talking about a, you know, a, a country that is uh, just entering sort of the, its industrial age uh, and it doesn't have very many job opportunities, uh, maybe you know, there's, there's something to be said about uh, about having that country, you know, allow child labor uh, until uh, until things get better. 
So somebody that's kind of like they're weighing the pros and cons and they can't decide like, yeah, you know, I don't like the idea of, you know, child labor, but I also, you know, I wouldn't want necessarily, I, but I, I wouldn't necessarily want to deprive them of all possible industry. So by thinking in the mindset of the fence sitter, that will help you come up with ideas for your classic argument. So the classic argument, the goal is to win, and how do you go about doing it? Well, here's a basic structure, but don't feel locked into this structure. There's a lot of different ways to write what I think of as a classical style argument. Any of these points that I mentioned, they might be one paragraph or they might be two, three, or four paragraphs. So think of these as different sections, not just different individual paragraphs. So section one, we can think of as the introduction. The introduction does what I've told you it should do in past videos, but I'll say it again. The introduction should hook the reader, give us an overview of the topic so we know what to expect, and deliver a main point, a thesis statement, the claim of your argument. So that introduction in an argument essay, that might be one paragraph, but it could also be, I could see it being two paragraphs. If my students wrote a two paragraph introduction, I think that would be great. Why two paragraphs? Well, maybe that hook, that emotional story that you start off with, maybe that's a full paragraph. And then the second paragraph is all about the topic overview and then delivers the thesis statement. That's a good reason for a two paragraph introduction. After that, we have the context section. What do we need to know about this? Do we need to define our terms? Do we need some historical background? Do we need to know about you know, the social implications or the, the perspective of society? Give us material. This part doesn't need to be as argument-based. This could be more logos or more fact-based, a little more objective. So give us the information that we need so that the reader understands what you're writing about and maybe understands the history or the background information. Again, if we're talking, uh, again, if you need more information about this, I have a quick video about defining your terms. That's really what's going on in this type of paragraph or in this type of section. So according to Aristotle, he would say that after we establish the context, then we sort of lay out, lay out maybe the, the, the uh, proposition or the proposal. And, uh, and that can happen in essays, but uh, again, adjusting for style. I think of you know, the, the laying things out as, as better suited for happening in the introduction section with the thesis statement. However, if you were going to write an argument that was proposing a lot of different changes, then maybe this would be that section. Uh, what's been going on in the world lately? A lot of stuff's been going on in the world. Okay, something like defund the police, right? Some people have been saying, hey, we should defund the police, but they don't just stop at that phrase that confuses a lot of people. They say, here's what we mean by defund the police. So that would be an example of this sort of length, lengthy sort of proposition or proposal, sort of laying out the, the different steps of this argument plan. I think in my class, most of the argument essays are going to be short enough that they probably won't have that kind of sophisticated layout, but I'm talking about what Aristotle's talking about, and if it's gonna be useful for your argument essay, I say go ahead and try it. Next up, confirmation. The confirmation section of a, a classical style essay, this is the evidence. So these are all the reasons. These are the, this is, maybe it's statistics, maybe it's facts, maybe it's philosophical reasoning. You know, it's, it's the evidence, it's this is the reason. So if your thesis statement is like, hey, we need to make this change because this is bad and we need to do this instead, then the confirmation section, which is probably going to be, I'm guessing, two, three, or four paragraphs, is going to be exploring all of the reasons of evidence. I've talked a little bit about the cartoon snowball effect, as I call it, and I want to mention that again. That means that we start with good points, and as the essay continues, we get to the greater points, right? The cartoon snowball starts off small and it ends up larger. So think of laying out the pieces of evidence in the same way. So if the confirmation section of an argument is, say, three paragraphs long, each paragraph has one developed piece of evidence, one reason or use of a fact or whatever it is. Uh, make sure you start with one that's pretty good, even better, and then the best, right? End with your strongest. If you start with your strongest and end with your weakest, it'll feel like the essay is not going in the right direction. Now, so far what I've been saying is pretty akin to what we've talked about with the basic 
essay structure. But here's the part that I love most about classic styled arguments, and that's the refutation section. The refutation section means that you look at the opposing view. So if you are writing against children making soccer balls, uh, instead of just giving your reasoning and saying like, it's bad, it's terrible, don't do it, don't do it, here are all the reasons, look how sad this is, here's some pathos, logos, and ethos. Instead of just ending it there, you would do research and find out, well, who is in favor of this and what are their reasons? Now, in a classic style argument, because your goal is to win, you want to win the reader over, you are not necessarily presenting the opposing side in a favorable way. You can be fair if you want to, and some uh, would argue that, oh, it's good to make little concessions and things like that. Again, going with the, how I have interpreted the classical style, since we want to win the reader over, I think it's effective to present the opposing side and then convince us why the opposing side is wrong, why they are not relevant, maybe they're ignorant, maybe they're even evil, right? So present the opposing side, focus on the negative aspects of the opposing side, or focus on the incorrect aspects of the opposing side. Now, if that seems too harsh, and you don't like the idea uh, of writing, you know, an essay in which you are righteous, and you are confident, and maybe even aggressive, if that's not your cup of tea, then a classical style argument might not be for you. You might like learning about a Rogerian argument, because that's a friendlier form of argumentation. But we'll save that for another video. If I get it made, I'll, I'll put a little link up there, so you can click on that and, and leave behind this mean, debate-oriented style of argumentation. So you refute the opposing views, and now we're ready for our conclusion. The conclusion wraps things up. Uh, as I've said before, I don't think it's effective to, to repeat the thesis statement word for word. It might be fine to, to look at what has been said before in the essay, but a good way to think of your conclusion is, as I've said before, a call to action. Call to action in a conclusion basically means that you are now telling us what to do, right? You've convinced us, you've given us the information. It's like, wow, I don't want soccer balls being made by children. What should I do? and you, you give them the tools. Maybe there's charities that can be donated to. Maybe you can write to people. Maybe you can make sure you don't shop at these stores. So what should we do? What's the call to action? Call to actions aren't the only way to conclude a good classical style argument. You might give us a warning of the future, right? Fill us with you know a little bit of fear. Or you might give us some hope. You might say things aren't so bad if we continue on this way. Uh, you might say that, hey, we need to really keep an eye on this or we need to continue to have discussions about this, or we need to change our hearts and minds about this. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a call to action in the sense of like, go and vote this way, or go and buy this product, or boycott this product, uh, but it is normally going to be filled with pathos, right? We are going to have emotion in the conclusion. I like to think of the conclusion as the final emotional impact of your essay. So do you want us to feel angry? Do you want us to feel scared? Do you want us to feel hopeful? How do you want the reader to feel? Think about that, and then you'll conclude your excellent classical style essay. Ah, uh, let's see. So I've gone over the different building blocks. I will leave the basic outline that I've mentioned uh, in the comments section, and I will make sure, of course, that it's on the, uh, the student's website on Canvas. I think that's it. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, or maybe you have some excellent examples to share of classical style arguments, please do so. In the meantime, keep writing, keep developing your ideas, keep on the lookout for different argument strategies, and obviously keep reading. The more you read and the more you read arguments, the better your writing will become. All right, that's it for now. Talk to you soon.